All right. Welcome everyone to this live stream of Engineering Trainer TV. Uh, my name is Luc Henne. I'm the CEO at engineeringtrainer.com. Uh, and today I will have, well, we will have a conversation with Edwin Schimmel. Um, Edwin is a project engineer at Dynaflow Research Group uh, and actually a former colleague of myself. Um, and I know for a fact that he has, you know, vast experience with, with fiberglass reinforced piping, both the theoretical aspects as uh, the practical implications. Um, and he's also the instructor on engineering trainer, um, one of the instructors on engineering trainer related to fiberglass reinforced plastic uh, courses. Um, we'll be discussing fiberglass and steel piping differences in engineering. Uh, we'll touch base on, you know, the material properties, uh, differences in, in pipe stress, um, pipe stress uh, analysis, and also the practical differences. Um, we'll aim to take roughly 30 to 45 minutes, maybe a bit longer if, if uh, we get uh, a lot of questions from, from you guys in the chat. Um, well, first and foremost, Edwin, welcome on board. It's an honor to have you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm all good. Thank you for having me here. All right. Um, from where are you tuning in, Edwin? I'm now in the Netherlands. Um, I'm doing uh, most of my work for the Dubai office, uh, but right now I'm in the Netherlands. I'm sitting in uh, in the office in our studio. Safe all right. To for the trainings. All right. All right. Um, well, uh, next to you, Edwin, I also want to thank everyone and welcome everyone uh, for joining this stream. Um, and I also want to invite everyone to join the chat. Uh, make sure, you know, to ask questions, provide comments. You know, these streams are all about showing our faces, connecting with, with you guys, our community, uh, and sharing knowledge from, uh, from the instructors. Um, and as always, you know, I would like to ask everyone uh, who's watching to share from where in the world you are uh, tuned in. So let us know in the chat uh, at this very moment uh, where you're based. It's always nice to see, you know, from, from where people are tuning in into these streams. Um, and if you if you value this content, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, visit the LinkedIn company profile of either Engineering Trainer and Dynaflow Research Group, and feel free by all means to connect with me or Edwin uh, on LinkedIn. Just shoot us a message, start a conversation. Uh, we're happy to to uh, get connected. Certainly. Um, having said all that, uh, Edwin, um, maybe it's it's you know a good start to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and also how you ended up with uh, working with fiberglass systems. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm uh, Edwin Schimmel, um, working now for 12 years at uh, Dynaflow. I uh, first studied aerospace engineering. Aerospace engineering brings together uh, structures, mechanical, and also flow, the aerodynamics. And exactly those two things I uh, combine in my work at, uh, at Dynaflow for fiberglass piping, but also for other piping, pressure vessels and all those. Um, yeah, so my complete uh, field of work is more broad. Um, uh, so it's also related to, to structural steel piping, pressure vessels, all this uh, equipment. But yeah. fiberglass is a large part of it. And over the years, I uh, became more and more specialized in fiberglass piping. So the, the engineering aspects, uh, but also uh, it's related to uh, the field installation, the uh, production of the, the pipe and the fittings in, in the factories, all those. And trainings uh, I give in this uh, subject. All right. So since when are you involved with uh, fiberglass? When I mean, not sure if you can remember it specifically. Yeah, but... no, that, that's easy to remember. It was my, my very first project at Dynaflow was uh, for ah, really? fiberglass piping, uh, a cooling water system, large bore cooling water system, uh, where we uh, improved the system, introduced uh, uh, expansion loops amongst others and other improvements uh, for the reliability of the system. Yeah, so it's okay. a long time ago. It is, yeah. And you, I know you've been based in Dubai and the Dubai office, um, where you work a lot with, with fiberglass and customers with fiberglass systems. Yeah. For how long were you in uh, Dubai, working from Dubai? Uh, for six years. For six years, I am uh, just uh, moved back to the Netherlands, although I'm uh, still involved uh, in the Dubai office, uh, this business development and projects there. Um, yeah, just uh, now in the Netherlands. Back right. again in our head office. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. 
Um, yeah, okay. Then uh, also tell something about the company uh, that I work for, so Dynaflow, with our head office in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, as I said, we focus, focus on us on uh, mechanical studies and flow studies. Uh, and we do the, the more specialized studies. So as we say ourselves, we work on the advanced end of the engineering spectrum, uh, mainly in four fields. So uh, mechanical, so conventional uh, piping, pressure vessels, heat exchanges, tanks, all this where we do the specialized studies like FEA, thermal studies, fatigue studies, uh, vibrations, which is uh, the vibration of piping where we do measurements, where we solve the vibration problems, but also pulsation studies for, uh, for pumps, for example, API studies. Uh, we work on fluid flow, uh, the flow in the piping, but also uh, flow uh, uh, optimization in equipment, for example, as you see in this uh, small illustration. Yeah. And fiberglass, that's a large part of our work where we uh, are involved in the engineering as well as the installation troubleshooting, uh, investigating failures where needed, uh, all this. All right, I see I see um, isotracer um, located in the fiberglass column. Um, I mean, yeah. I don't want to get too salesy, but but obviously we have this free <laughs> course on, on isotracer on the engineering.com platform. Maybe you can tell a little bit about it, like what is isotracer? Yeah, uh, so we also develop software and we resell software. So we develop uh, boss pills. Boss fluids and isotracer. Isotracer, if you if you model uh, the piping in a pipe stress package like CISA2, uh, you can do this. Uh, you can print the isometric and start uh, marking up node numbers and then uh, fill in all the information on the isometric drawing in the CISA2 program or a similar program. But we have, uh, well, one of my colleagues thought this is a lot of work and he started developing something himself to accelerate this work, to right. uh, click fast on your isometric and then build the model. Uh, so the, the program uh, automatically puts your node numbers on it. It, uh, if you, while you click, the program recognizes the direction of the piping. So you don't need to enter this all in, in CISA. You just click on the drawing and enter the, the lengths and everything else is uh, taken care of. So you end up with uh, digital marked up isometrics and a complete model uh, in CISA 2. So that uh, was a good idea from a colleague and we built it out to a complete program. Yeah. All right, that sounds pretty sweet. I mean, I've, I've been able to use it um, for once which was uh, a blast, so to speak. It feels like uh, gaming. So, yeah. um, all right. I mean, thanks thanks for highlighting that one. Um, uh, yeah, let's move on. Yeah. So in what we do in fiberglass uh, itself. Um, yeah, so we provide analysis support, which is, uh, so all the analysis like pipe stress, uh, shirts, buried piping, studies. Uh, we provide project support which is uh, in the preliminary phase. Uh, we, uh, well, a fiberglass material, it's, it has three components that you need to take care of. So good quality of material, uh, which we cover by, for example, factory inspections, qualification reviews, quali uh, qualification testing, uh, inspections. Um, the engineering is of course important uh, that we mm. talk about today, so that we, we review and we are present during the installation to supervise and to advise uh, and to improve the work method statements, all this. Mm. Um, and we do design support, which is for the pipe manufacturers to uh, do detailed studies to improve their components, the reliability of the components, uh, design pipe supports, all this. Yeah. All right. What, what would you say like testing is? I see testing in the right column. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so, um, oh, I should have mentioned that maybe. Uh, so we have our own material lab. Uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. right here next to me. So we do testing when there are, is a failure investigation. When we're doing a failure investigation, you want to test the material. But also for uh, brownfield or uh, greenfield uh, projects, then sometimes uh, we test as like a second opinion. Uh, we test the material. So we have a complete lab with all the common fiberglass piping tests. Uh, it, so we use it in green and brown field projects as well as in fill investigations. All right, all right. So, um, uh, like, just just like a, a follow-up question is like, 
it, I see five fabrication inspections in the second column. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, what does that mean? What are typical things you would be interested in if you um, do such an inspection? Yeah. Um, yeah, fiberglass, of course, is a laminate. So there are more aspects that play a role uh, compared to uh, steel piping. So you have different raw materials and to bring it together, the laminate uh, that, that has more aspects that you need to get, pay uh, attention to and also okay. more things that, uh, that can go wrong or that affect the quality. So we look to the raw materials, to the production machines and tools, uh, the, the QC, the traceability, but also the fabrication of fittings, uh, yeah, uh, all those aspects. So it's uh, quite a broad, uh, broad activity. All right. Okay. Um, and and um, before we continue, I, I saw this uh, large like image at the start of your slides. Could you maybe go back to to the first slide you prepared? Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. I mean, this is a fascinating image. I mean, uh, yeah, it is. What, what are we looking at? It is. It's uh, a project we worked on in the past, and um, yeah, we sometimes used it in, uh, like, for example, uh, our presentations. Um, but it's so huge, it's fiberglass right? pipe, and indeed, it's huge. The diameter is four meter. It's of course really impressive. Uh, yeah. You can see the scale if you see. He disappeared a little bit behind the text. You see a person here. I hope right. you can see him. So he's maybe one meter, uh, meter 80. And I think we'll have difficulty to reach just uh, the half the height of the pipe. So four meter. And four meters is more or less the, the maximum that you can uh, uh, reach with, with fiberglass piping. At the moment, we do a project with uh, piping of 3.5 meter diameter. Uh, so soon I will uh, see that with my own eyes. Um, uh, so uh, during a site visit. But that's uh, that's quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds exciting. So, what what uh, kind of system was this? Is this? Um, yeah, I must say it's before my time, so I don't know all the details. But um, I would yeah for these large sizes, then uh, of this either cooling water uh, or sea water uh, or uh, water that is used as intake for desalination in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I believe this is also in the Middle East. Uh, you can see it, it's uh, it's sandy. So yeah, with yeah. large diameter pipe like this, it's you use it in lower pressure applications. So uh, cooling water uh, desalination units. Uh, that's what typically used for. All right. Yeah. Okay, I mean, yeah. Thanks Thanks for sharing it. As I, as I mentioned, it looks like a very impressive system. Yeah, it is. It's uh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you asked me to to tell a bit about uh, engineering and the differences with uh, fiberglass engineering when you compare it with steel. Uh, yeah, I thought first let's uh, explain a bit about what is fiberglass material before we dive uh, into the actual topic. Uh, and also we'll look to a model uh, later. That's uh, something I prepared. But uh, fiberglass material, so it consists of uh, two ingredients. Uh, one is glass fibers, obviously. Right. The second one is is a resin, so that is a plastic. It can be a polyester, phenolester, uh, epoxy, and these two you bring together, and then you get what you see in the lower uh, picture. So a complete pipe where the plastic obviously has cured to uh, form a, a fixed shape. So we have the glass how, how fibers. Long, how long, uh, Edwin, would such a curing process typically take? Yeah, I think? It depends a bit on the on the type of uh, resin, but uh, epoxy. Uh, if you have produced the pipe, it's, it's of course still viscous uh, liquid, and you cure it for three hours, and then you have like uh, you have baked your pipe, so to say. But with polyester or phenolester, it, it cures uh, uh, faster and with less uh, heat. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So the the glass fibers, it's it's there obviously for the for the strength and and for the stiffness. And the resin also has a function. It, it keeps the fibers together, of course. It, uh, it makes it watertight. Also, we need to uh, use the plastic for, of course. And it protects the, the fibers because the, the glass fibers, they don't like uh, the, normally the pipe contents. But the plastic is, uh, well, it uh, protects the glass fibers, including mm -hmm. a liner. So, so what would you say, Edwin? I mean, just um, starting, you know, the comparison a little bit. Um, 
you know what are what are the advantages of fiberglass reinforced piping you know when when would you when would a system owner typically choose for fiberglass yeah it has uh, the one major advantage of fiberglass is that corrosion resistant so mm -hmm. that is where it's often used so we often see it uh, in applications uh, with water uh, so especially when it's saline water so like sea water that's used for uh, for cooling or uh, it's used for firefighting then yeah, uh, you need to do something to protect the, the piping. Uh, carbon steel uh, will right. not uh, last long. Uh, but it's also used in chemical applications. So uh, we have a lot of chemical liquids uh, that don't go well with, with, with carbon steel. And yeah. uh, the benefit is that you have different types of resins and you can apply different types of uh, resins for the liner. So you can uh, even make a custom-made liner that is resistant to the, the chemical substance in your in your pipe. So that's mm -hmm. another uh, big advantage. Okay. And also it's it has a low flow resistance, uh, it's lightweight, uh, the, the jointing is cheap, so you can install it fast, so it has uh, some advantages, but the main uh, reason to choose for fiberglass is uh, it's not uh, corrosive. Right, right, that's right. That's a big advantage. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine, you know, with, with seawater, that would be like a, a big thing. Otherwise, you'd have to go for you know um, stainless steel or something, which is yeah too expensive. You know, expensive. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. You can also work with liners, but of course, that's uh, the liner can come off or it can damage, and then the mm -hmm. water still has access to your uh, pipe. Uh, fiberglass doesn't have a liner. Uh, okay, it has a liner, but also behind the liner is uh, is more plastic. It's all plastic, yeah. so uh, you have a product that is inherently safe uh, with with water applications. Hmm. All right, thanks. Um, I mean, uh, we already have several questions, you know, uh, coming in in the chat as well. Um, yeah. I will park them for now, um, but I'll definitely come back to them uh, later. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, Partran, Faris, uh, thanks for asking them, and, and um, uh, we'll get back to, to you for sure. Okay, the actual uh, subject. So uh, differences with uh, with steel. Uh, so I made first a list with with some uh, differences. So uh, carbon steel is isotropic, which means that uh, isotropic means that your uh, material has the same properties in all directions. So in the pipe, right. you have some conventional direction and the actual direction, and steel has the same uh, stiffness and, and strength in all directions. While with fiberglass, it's not, and you can even tailor and uh, uh, direct the fibers with your uh, expected uh, highest load. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you have, uh, if you pressurize the pipe, you have more hoop stress. So I can even tailor the pipe by putting more fibers in the hoop direction. Uh, other differences uh, relevant to engineering is the, the thermal expansion. It's uh, higher with fiberglass. No problem, but you need to take it into account in the design. It's more yeah. flexible which is in, in pipe design is, uh, is an advantage, uh, at least most of the time. Do, it can... do you have an idea how much more flexible? Just like ballpark? Yeah, um, yeah so then it becomes more complex because it uh, has different properties in different directions, but in the, right. in the hoop direction, it's, it's 10 times more flexible. And in the actual direction, it's even more uh, 15 to 20 times more flexible. Hmm. That's, uh, that's quite a difference. Yeah. And so, Fiberglass piping, if if you put it under pressure, it already expands. So that is uh, quite a difference with steel, and something yeah. you need to take into account in your uh, in your design. All right, all right. So it, it expands. I'm just thinking out loud here in both axial and, and hoop direction. I would say uh, when you bring it under pressure. Yeah, indeed. So um, yeah, if you have carbon steel pipe, it it expands also but it's so little that you don't take it into account in your design. Yeah. With the fiberglass pipe, it expands. Uh, so if on a long stretch of, uh, let's say, uh, 50 meters, it can expand by uh, 10 or 20 millimeters, of course, depending on the pressure that you apply. Yeah. But it's uh, it's something you take into account. Uh, so with pipe stretch analysis, it's taken into account, of course, but uh, it's uh, it's something different compared yeah. to, uh, to steel design. All right. Yeah. And the last interesting difference is also uh, that you have different uh, jointing options. I've prepared a, se a separate slide for that, but uh, I can also look a bit into that. All right, yeah, I would love to. 
Yeah, so a big difference with, with fiberglass piping is that uh, it's not standardized. So with, with uh, carbon steel piping, you have, for example, the uh, a schedule size like schedule 40, then you can look up uh, what is the right. uh, uh, the thickness of your pipe. You have uh, standardized material properties, uh, standardized fittings, designs. Like, like the anti tables, right? Yeah, 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 indeed. And uh, that 150 pound flange. Uh, I guess it all sounds very familiar to uh, people with working with steel. With fiberglass, it's not like this. So that has uh, uh, consequences and advantages. Uh, consequence is that when you do engineering, you need to uh, pay attention to using the, the values from the manufacturer. Uh, so it's manufacturer dependent, uh, the values that you use in your design, in your engineering. And uh, well, the benefit is that uh, it's not standardized. So the, the manufacturer has the freedom to tailor your piping for a specific project. It can make it matching with your project specification or with uh, specific circumstances in your project. So mm -hmm. that's uh, a benefit. And also if your pipe has uh, from a certain manufacturer has a higher, uh, well, higher pressure capability or uh, with, for a certain amount of material, then it benefits from that because you take that into account. It's not, uh, the strength is not capped by some kind of standard. Yeah. I mean, I, I would see, I can see a lot of advantages, but but I, I can also see, you know, challenges. Um, I mean, of the, 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 the customer project customization can be a huge cost saving, I would say, but um, I would guess, but um, how do you approach uh, uh, quality control if, if it is not standardized? Yeah, so that is uh, it's something that uh, requires more attention. That is uh, true. So, of course, when there's no standardization, there's the risk that you make uh, mistakes in the engineering. Uh, in in uh, in a pipe program, you with steel, you just select a certain material, and that's it. Uh, with with fiberglass, you need to uh, uh, use the right values. Values can change, so that uh, you need to be aware of. It shouldn't be a problem, but. Uh, you need to uh, pay the right attention. And also, if you uh, make a preliminary design, then if you select the manufacturer after that, you uh, need to yeah, take his actual values and update your, uh, for example, your stress analysis or other engineering uh, calculations to uh, right. match the pipe. So that's also a reason that normally, or normally, but very often, the pipe manufacturer is also supplying the engineering, so the stress analysis, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes also the search analysis, the the, the buried pipe calculations, uh, as he's of course the one best aware of uh, the material properties. It's more right. like a one-stop shop in 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 the fiberglass piping world. All right, all right. Yeah, that's interesting. And it can, yeah, as you as you said, like if you do stuff during, like, say, feed stage or or uh, like initial stage of the project. Um, yeah, the numbers can change. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, you, you select a certain pipe for certain applications, so you stay a bit in the same ballpark. But uh, yeah. yeah, exact numbers are there dependent on the manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. And and does that mean that you, let's say, with, with uh, you know, the standardized thicknesses within the steel um, applications, um, you might end up with, with a thickness that is a little bit thicker than you actually need for your pressure, for example, um, and, and for your loads. Um, is, is like thickness customized in, in these projects in, in FRP piping? Do you always say, you know, we, we do the calculations first and then come to a thickness? Yeah, it, it is sometimes uh, custom made. So with, with small piping, uh, just a, a standard catalog is, uh, is followed. Uh, not not okay. uh, made specific, but for with bigger projects, for example, uh, what we see here in the photo, it, it's very common that, uh, yeah, specific for the project, a custom wall thickness is uh, designed, or uh, maybe that during the project, based on the pipe stress analysis, the, the wall thickness is changed a bit, uh, higher or lower, uh, whatever is needed to, uh, to, to meet the requirements. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that's, a, that's a benefit and that you can change. Yeah. All right. All right. I mean, you already mentioned the image, and again, you know, images it's are impressive. always yeah. always nice, and this this one is impressive as well. Like, um, 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit what we are looking at again? Is this the same system as in the initial image? Yeah, it's the same system, but uh, smaller diameter. Uh, yeah, probably you especially think what do I see on top of, uh, of the photo that yeah, those are the yeah. vacuum breakers. So above ground, uh, the, the, the pipe, like steel piping, it uh, cannot sustain full vacuum. So these uh, vacuum breakers, uh, so type of valves there on top, so in case you get an under pressure in your system, the valve opens and then air is ingested in the pipe and it uh, prevents the vacuum to right. keep the pipe safe. Yeah. For, right. buried, so for buried systems, you don't need it, for, uh, but uh, for uh, above ground systems, this, uh, this you need. Okay, so for, that's interesting. For buried systems, you don't need it. Hmm. Yeah. All right, what, why yeah, is it? Yeah. Um, so if you have a uh, pipe underground, you can. When, when you put an under pressure on it, a, a vacuum, then you can imagine that the pipe, it, it wants to deform and in the end collapse. Uh, right. Yeah, but if like the pipe is in the ground... Hmm? Like implode. Like yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it first overlies and then in the end it completely implodes and collapses. But underground, the soil, it restrains the pipe. So it, it like keeps it in shape. So it keeps the, right. the round shape, the, the pipe cannot deform because the, the soil in, uh, counteracts it. So that's why, of course, it depends on the stiffness of the soil and, and uh, things like that. Uh, but normally it's uh, fully vacuum resistant. But above mm -hmm. ground, of course, we don't have this. So uh, it's uh, uh, more susceptible to vacuum. So that is why it makes sense that this pipe, it, that we see a vacuum breaker on it, yeah. while underground, uh, that is something that's not needed. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Um... I mean, thanks for, for sharing and showing this image. Um, I remember uh, us having a question in the chat. Let's see if I can find it briefly related to this. I mean, we see these big supports, right? Yeah. Um, and and uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how in, in supports like these, um, you do like the connection between the steel and the fiberglass? You know, is there like a... Um, uh, is it direct contact? How is that organized? Yeah, so the um, the fiberglass piping, it does not like uh, uh, point loads, very localized loads. So the, the supports of fiberglass are a bit wider. So you distribute the loads. Yeah. And the second thing is that uh, you put a bit of uh, neoprene or rubber in between of the pipe and the support. So because you don't like the, the point loads, but yeah. also because the pipe is very flexible. So uh, it's in the hoop direction, in the ring direction, it's 10 times more flexible. So you put rubber uh, in between because of the flexibility, if you pressurize it, the pipe wants to expand by, well, a small fraction, but still it is uh, uh, something you cannot neglect. So yeah. it wants to expand radially by, uh, let's say one millimeter, but the support keeps it in, yeah, that cannot expand if you just have uh, no rubber in between. The, yeah, the, yeah. the diameter is fixed. And if at the support it cannot um, expand, but outside the support it can expand, they get a big discontinuity and the rubber helps to uh, alleviate that. Yeah, right. So that is something that, okay, it's also, it doesn't like point loads in the first place, but it's just different how it expands. It's because of the higher flexibility, so you need to take that into account. And this is a standard yeah. solution to use uh, rubber, but uh, you should not leave it out. Mm. Mm. All right. I mean, we have a, um, a pipe tran uh, who is asking the question, uh, for the pipe support of FRP piping, what is the thickness of the neoprene pad between the shoe clamp and the FRP pipe? I think this, this would be a good time to uh, uh, discuss that. Do you have any idea, thicknesses yeah. of the neoprene pads? Yeah, it's something like it depends a bit on the diameter of the pipe, of course, but something like uh, five millimeters, something of that uh, ballpark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just a thin layer. Uh, that does it does it like scale with diameter or, or um, with with like uh, resin or are these like no, values? no, it does theoretically a bit, but normally it's just a standard thickness of a few millimeter, five or maybe even less, three. That uh, that will do. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. thanks. Of yeah. course, it also helps the the, the the accuracy of the of the support needs to be a bit less because you put rubber in between anyway. That uh, is also very practical, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fair point. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I already touched a bit upon it. Uh, so it's it's much more flexible and it has a certain uh, number of implications. Um, yeah, well, the pipe expands under pressure. That's what I already yeah. touched upon. Um, and also, um, it, also interesting is that with fiberglass pipe, uh, you get lower surge pressures. So uh, it might be surprising, but that is uh, that is the case with fiberglass. So lower surge pressures, of course, helps to uh, yeah to 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 stay within the labels easier. Mm. Um, and I have a separate slide about that. Maybe it sounds a bit surprising, but I will explain more. Um, well, yeah, I mean, also. It it's it's very easy i would love to dive into that like um higher flexibility lower pressure surges you know um, why is that would my my question be but but uh, yeah. feel free to get back to that later huh. yeah oh no <laughs> um we're already there um yeah so the so the the pipe is less of uh, sorry uh more flexible and uh the stiffness of the pipe it might maybe surprise you but it affects the the wave the the speed of sound of your pressure wave. So if you have uh, your piping system full with uh, any liquid, let's say water, if yeah. you operate a valve, uh, the valve opens or closes, or the pump starts or stops, then you generate uh, a pressure wave because uh, the pressure changes due to the pump or uh, due to the opening of the valve. In this pressure wave, this pressure fluctuation travels through the system at the speed of sound. Um, and the speed of sound of this pressure wave traveling in the system is uh, from this formula. And it has several parameters, uh, amongst others, the pipe diameter, right. the pipe thickness, but also the E modulus. And of course, these all can vary a bit for the uh, type of pipe, but the E modulus is, of course, a completely different number. As I said, the, the hoop modulus can be 10 times lower. Yeah. Uh, that gives quite a difference. So then, um uh, if this is 10 times lower it then it's uh the wave speed also becomes a lot lower and from search analysis uh maybe if you had a a bit of theory about it uh you might know that the the pressure waves the pressure fluctuations they are um uh linear with, with the wave speed so then uh the wave the wave right. speed of uh in the fiberglass pipe is only half of what is this in carbon steel or even lower so then also pressure fluctuations become only half so that is quite uh, quite a big difference yeah it helps your uh, yeah. system design i've even put here two uh, examples um, so if you have a completely uh, two identical systems uh, with the only difference being that in one system you have fiberglass the other one you have uh, steel and then um, if you also do the same action yeah so you open or so you close the valve in two seconds then this is the pressure uh that you find in the fiberglass system so it got up to uh let's say with a bit of rounding 160 uh, uh meter water column so yeah. 16 bar oh so that of course helps quite a bit uh the fiberglass pipe is less susceptible to uh to search effects mm. Right. Maybe surprised, yeah. but uh, that's a benefit of fiberglass. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. And we, we uh, just for the listeners out there, I mean, we have a free uh, training module on, on water hammer and on this equation on the top right um, on, uh, on the engineandtrain.com platform. So if, if you know, if you're interested in this equation and, and the graphs that we're seeing here, um, make sure to, to tune in on that uh, free module on, on uh, water hammer phenomena in, in industrial piping systems. It will also help you to grasp the uh, you know the details of the of the plots that are shown here. Um, but all right, I mean I, it sounds like Edwin, I, I'm, um, I've been in contact you know with search analysis uh, a little bit, and we always you know I always thought about it like if you have let's say surge or, or pressure dynamics in let's say a really flexible um, uh, uh, pipe or, or let's say like a, a tube like a water hose or something like that um yeah then then the effects are much less and it looks like this is yeah. some, somewhere like in between or something yeah yeah in, in, in yeah and uh the simple hose is much more flexible and uh you have less shirts in that uh, 
of course, uh, still, if you open a water tap, you see your hose uh, moving. That's exactly right. uh, shirts. Um, yeah, indeed. Um, well, other differences. So we have uh, pipe expansion under pressure, which we don't have with steel. We did dust dependent, so that is uh, something different in your uh, different in your pipe design. For yeah. example, if you do a hydro test, that is the the highest pressure that you will apply to your system in its lifetime, uh, the 1.5 times the design pressure. Right. Um, and the design pressure is, of course, already higher than the operating pressure. So then with the fiberglass pipe, you also see a lot of pipe expansion. As with uh, carbon steel, it hardly expands in the actual direction. With yeah. fiberglass, it does. So if you do a hydro test uh, of a steel line, well, you don't see anything happening. It's just laying there. But with fiberglass, if you hydro test it, it will expand. So at the at the corner points, at the elbows, you will really see it growing, expanding a bit. Uh, this is something you need to take into a, uh, account, for example, by the pipe stress analysis. Uh, in um, We do a pipe stress analysis, a hydro test for uh, steel piping. Uh, nothing happens. Right. Uh, there's not much to see. Uh, but with fiberglass, it does. It expands, and that's something you take into account in the pipe stress now so the for the hydro test load case is really a critical case in your uh, in your stress analysis because of this pipe expansion mm. all right yeah. yeah yeah and yeah of course uh the flexibility helps for the for the nozzle load so when you have uh, equipment like a pump or compressor then when you use fiberglass it uh yeah uh, typically it gives uh, lower nozzle loads which of course is uh Better for the life uh, lifespan of your pump or compressor or filter or other equipment. Yeah, just just like elaborating on that a little bit. Like, how how are these connected? So you have these fiberglass pipe section and then a steel equipment. I, I guess let's assume a steel equipment. Um, are yeah. these just nozzled together, or sorry, a flange together? Yeah, uh, that's the only uh, option. That is uh, right. Just a flange. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, now no, that we already touched upon, um, yeah, another interesting uh, characteristic of the material is that it's isotropic, uh, sorry, and isotropic, uh, the fiberglass material. So it has uh, different strengths in the direct in different directions, and you can tailor your your fiberglass uh, fibers uh, depending on the application that you have. So if in a certain type of system you uh, need more actual strength you mm -hmm. uh, use a pipe that has more uh, more fibers oriented in the actual direction why, why uh, would you need more actual strength um yeah that so if you uh, have pressurized applications then the, the hoop strength is two times the the actual oh, sorry the hoop stress is two times the actual stress uh, that right. is the famous Kettle formula for everybody works with piping and pressure vessels. Yeah. So then, in that case, you orient the fibers a little bit more to the hoop direction. So you have yeah. more hoop strength. Uh, but there are also applications that you need a lot of actual strength. So if you have above ground piping uh, on supports, and the supports are uh, wide apart, uh, for example, in marine applications, you have that often, then you can use uh, piping with more actual stress. Um, and for example, when uh, you also have application where you need especially hoop strength. Uh, so you have also pipes that you have the majority of the fibers in the hoop strength. Uh, for example, uh, sewer piping. Uh, yeah, then you right. uh, you don't. It's pressureless, the sewer. So you you mainly you need uh, hoop strength because the pipe is buried normally. So you have uh, soil loads. You have also vehicle oh. loads uh, crossing. Uh, above ground over the pipe, so then uh, you use yeah you add more fibers in the hoop direction, and then it's strong in the hoop direction. So you can really tailor for uh, for whatever you need. All right, all right. I mean, okay, so that's interesting. And, and um, I mean, I see a mat like like uh, um, the top image shows like um, yeah. some woven strings, and the and the bottom one shows like a single string, right? Yeah. Which one is like how are these used for? Uh, Manufacturing fiberglass reinforced pipe. Yeah. So if we use if we uh, fabricate the pipe, then we have this uh, what we see here. So then loose fibers are uh, wound on the on the mold. So the mold is spinning, 
and the fibers around uh, around it. Uh, of course, many fibers at a time. Um, but when you uh, fabricate fittings or, or flanges, that is uh, often done manually. And then, yeah, to, to work with one fiber at a time, you, it, it will take a long time. So then they use uh, what they call woven roving. So we see uh, glass fibers are woven. That's prefabricated. Uh, that's how you order the glass. And it's on a wall. Yeah. In this wall, you you uh, you apply manually to 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 fabricate a fitting, a T or an elbow, yeah. uh, or a flange. Then you use this. Uh, this is more practical and faster to you to uh, to make manual components. But the pipe is for, from this. So in the end, all glass fibers, but in a different product. Yeah, right. also have right. more forms like uh, chopped fibers, uh, the short fibers that are put in the pipe. They uh, they are oriented in every direction, so they give strength in every direction. We have uh, quite some choices. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, now, a last uh, difference between fiberglass uh, piping and carbon steel piping, uh, also relevant for the engineering, is that with fiberglass, you have a lot of different type of joints, uh, and even uh, yeah, joints with a completely different function. So you have, um, yeah, with steel, almost always you have uh, just welded joints or flanged. Yeah, welded or flanged. Uh, so they're all tensile resistant, but with fiberglass you have different types. So you have uh, tensile resistant joints. Uh, you see here, for example, an uh, adhesive joint. So you have a bell and a spigot and you move one in the other with uh, adhesive. Uh, yeah. You also have laminated joint that you, uh, the woven roving that you just saw the holes, you wind them around the pipe uh, and together with resin, of course, and that then gives you uh, a joint. It's a second option. Um, and here we see another option. Uh, this is uh, a flexible uh, joint in fiberglass uh, piping. So here... Flexible as in, as in it allows for bending or something. Yeah, yeah, rotation. Um, so again, we have a bell here, yeah, this one, and this is the spigot, and you move one in the other. Yeah. But now the it's less rigid because you don't use adhesive, but um, you have grooves in 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 both, and you put uh, a rubber gasket in it or any uh, good gasket material, yeah. but, uh, normally rubber, and that seals the pipe. And yeah, th maybe it looks like uh, fragile or because it's just rubber, but like uh, flanges also have a uh, just a gasket and that can contain a lot of pressure and also here it's uh, used in uh, for pretty high pressures um, and apart from these two uh, sealing gaskets uh, what you see here is a locking ring and that's the component right. in some of the joints you have it and sometimes you don't have it if it's here then uh, well there's a groove in the in the spigot a groove in the bell and the locking ring is in between of the two and it, it takes tensile forces so uh, the pressure Right. Uh, force the pressure twist it, it sustains so you cannot pull it apart but that's the big variation with uh, with steel piping that with fiberglass piping you have non-tensile resistant joints so then the locking ring is not here and then uh, well the, the tensile force in the actual direction are not transmitted so uh, that you can yeah. use in specific applications where you use truss blocks they uh, take the pressure trust and the pressure trust is not transmitted so a different type of design, uh, which is uh, also well feasible and often used for, uh, uh, yeah, for example, cooling water systems. But the the, the interesting here is that, um, yeah, it's not bonded with with glue or, or laminate, so it keeps a bit of flexibility. So at truss blocks, you can use this um, this type of joint, and as you said, it or uh, guessed already, it allows for a bit of rotation. So if there's a bit of sediment on the of the truss block, then it's just easily accommodated by uh, by this type of joint. So that has a benefit. Mm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of choices. Uh, well, with engineering, with with uh, yeah, steel piping, there's not much to choose from. Well, yeah, the joint yeah, yeah. or uh, flange joint, but uh, flange joint I would not put everywhere. So then only the welded joint is left. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, I uh, also prepared a small example. 
so of course um, the different types of engineering studies for fiberglass right? so uh, search uh, stress uh, buried piping uh, ring uh, ring calculations but the most uh, common analysis is pipe stress analysis so I uh, prepared a model uh, I will just show the model there right, it is. I think, I think Edwin, you know, looking at time, let's let's discuss this model, have a little bit of discussion about it, and then go to uh, some of the questions. I mean, there yeah. were several very interesting questions. Okay. Okay. Um, and and uh, you know, I think uh, we'll be well and you know, uh, uh, well talking for one hour at a time. So I think that's a good uh, good schedule to take. Yeah. So, so. So what are we looking at here, Edwin? Yeah. So we have a uh, water treatment system. Uh, so, it, right. and what you might especially notice, it's very closely spaced. Huh? So there's almost yeah. no straight pipe. It is uh, fitting after fitting after equipment. Here's equipment, water treatment, uh, more fittings, uh, these and elbows. So it's very closely spaced. And yeah, with uh, with fiberglass, you can actually manufacture that because um, the spools are manufactured by hand and also the fitting. So. If you want these uh, two branches very close to each other, that's just possible. Uh, well, with steel, yeah, you have standard components. With, with fiberglass, you also have standard components. But if you want to have something special that is uh, it's not so special in fiberglass, it can easily be manufactured. So this uh, in this project, it was a benefit that it was fiberglass because it yeah. could be made so closely spaced. And can you tell um, us a little bit about like the details of what we are looking at? I mean, I see a lot of like um, equipment, rigid elements. Yeah. Uh, what are these? Yeah. So we have here. Uh, so it's water treatment. So this is chlorination unit uh, where uh, the water is chlorinated. Um, also have a flow meter um, here. You have a lot of valves, and then here we have uh, filters and. Uh, of course, the fields are the most critical component, um, or not the field itself, but the nozzles are the critical components in the study. So yeah. here, the system has uh, bellows, right? so ah. expansion joints with, with tie rods. And maybe that's also something specific for, for fiberglass. So if uh, expansion joints in the steel piping system, they are from steel themselves, like uh, right. harmonic. Uh, but with fiberglass, the, the bellows are often with uh, with rubber uh, because uh, yeah, if you have fiberglass which is very flexible, and then you introduce uh, a steel expansion joint or a bellow, of course the uh, yeah it, it's steel, so it's still quite stiff. So with fiberglass, you use uh, a rubber bellow where the flexibility is, of course, is lower, and that's relatively better uh, to use with the fiberglass. Mm. So that's also a difference that uh, bellows, it's, it's always rubber instead of uh, steel. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I mean, I see uh, like uh, the um, gray, grayish piping and the bluish. What, what is the bluish part? Why is it blue? Yeah, that's, um, well, that's something we used in this model. Actually, not because uh, it's fiberglass, but something we just uh, uh, like in our office to use. So the, the gray piping. It's uh, the scope piping, so that is the piping ah. that was replaced. While the the quasi piping uh, here and here on, on this side is the existing piping. Uh, it's uh, from a different uh, manufacturer, so with different material properties, and it's not stress analyzed there, but it's uh, included for overlap purposes for the right boundary conditions. And I just we we like to see what is the continuation piping or what's the scope piping. So we use, uh, people are familiar with CISA2. Um, yeah. yeah, if you use the line numbers, you can, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, do the bookkeeping of your line numbers. Yeah. You can also use it for different uh, uh, purposes. So here we uh, give the scope piping, we make it one group with the color and continuation piping, uh, we use a different color and that uh, keeps it organized, especially when you work yeah. with colleagues or you check the work from other colleagues, then uh, a bit keep it, keeping it a bit organized is always good. Yeah, yeah okay, so it's a visual, yeah. visual thing, but good bookkeeping, bookkeeping exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah the bookkeeping uh, trick it, it is. So, so I mean, just that. looking at this system, I mean, uh, it's um, a very compact system, as you mentioned. So, so what are typical, let's say, solution methods that you can apply when, when working with um, 
uh, with fiberglass if you if you uh, obtain any high stresses during analysis. Yeah, um, yeah. What you what you do with, um, with when you analyze carbon steel piping, then what you most often see is that the fitting is uh, is overstressed, uh, right. because in uh, uh, for example the T, uh, because they have a high stress concentration because the discontinuity, yeah. uh, and with fiberglass it's. Uh, you see that less often because the the fiberglass fittings they are made thicker compared to the the straight pipe uh, significantly significantly uh, thicker. Okay. Um, so uh, typically the the wall total wall thickness of the the T is twice that of the of the pipe of the same size connecting. So due to this, the fittings are normally not the the weakest point uh, like steel. So with steel. Fittings are the weakest point, and then you can replace them with uh, a different, stronger type of fitting. For example, the T, you replace it for uh, a stronger T with a reinforcing pad. Yeah. Um, but with fiberglass, normally the highest stress you find next to the fitting. So if we uh, use colors for the to see the the wall thicknesses, you see that. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah it's very colorful now. Um, yeah, so the the elbow has a certain high thickness, and the pipe next to it is is thinner. So normally there you see the higher stress. And yeah, your question was how to uh, solve this. Uh, what what you can do about it, of course, uh, the regular methods like uh, reroute, uh, for example, but and or change the supporting. Right. But with uh, with fiberglass piping, we have one additional uh, method in our arsenal to to solve the stresses and that is that we if, for example the stress in this area is high then we can just apply additional thickness by uh, laminating uh, on this stretch of piping yeah? so we uh, we saw a previous uh, picture where we saw the laminated joint where they apply the woven roving and uh, wind it around the pipe right but you the, Cannot, yeah, you can do it at, at joints, but also just a straight pipe. Huh? Why not? Uh, yeah. So that you can do. And by doing that, you increase the wall thickness. It could, well, would be practical to make the same thickness as the as the elbow, for example. And yeah, it's a simple logic that with the higher wall thickness, the stress is reduced. So if your stress is here, let's say 110%, then in your stress analysis, you uh, determine how much extra thickness uh, you need. Maybe you add uh, 5 mm extra wall thickness, which in right. the field, they uh, apply as a laminate. And that solves the stress. So that uh, uh, is a yeah, well, convenient way to, to solve the problems. Mm. All right. Um... I mean, I mean, thanks. That's very interesting. And I'm sure as when we can uh, continue discussing and debating a model like this for hours, I mean, um, uh, you know, how to set the allowables, how does that differ from steel load cases, you know, um, but, but let's keep that for another time maybe. Um, and uh, let's move to, to the questions that, that several people have asked in the chat. Um, so, so, and I actually think one topic that is uh, passing in the chat that is, you know, touched in the chat uh, on a few occasions is these, you know, stress intensification factors. You already mentioned uh, that, that, you know, stress concentrations um, in steel systems are very important. You know, they are, um, uh, you know, manifested within stress intensification factors for, for steel systems. Um, how is that approach for, for uh, FRP? Yeah, for FRP, um... Yeah, you have like for steel, you have different uh, ways that you can use to uh, determine the shift factors. Uh, with steel, you have formulas that are like crude estimates for your uh, SIF, stress right. intensification factor, and we have the same for uh, fiberglass. Um, so also, but also like with steel, you can uh, you're allowed to come up with a different, uh, better or more accurate uh, SIF. And use that in your analysis. So that is not really different uh, compared to uh, steel piping. There's only one uh, one important difference is that with with steel, as I said, normally the the fitting itself is the weak point. So uh, the sieve you apply there that makes sense. Uh, yeah. They have stress concentration. Uh, but with fiberglass piping, 
often the failure is uh, yeah in the straight pipe connecting to the fittings just next to the fitting so that has been covered in the in the last issue of the of the iso design standard iso 14692 is uh, the most used code for fiber glass piping okay. um, and that applies the sieve on the edges of the fitting not the fitting itself but on uh -huh. the edge of the fitting um, so you get the stress concentration on the on the on the edge of the fitting which applies for the joint and also the straight pipe just next to the joint so if you find an overstress uh, you can uh, create a reinforcement but that will be then next to the to the fitting right. and that is that is also exactly what you see in the field so uh, part of our work is the investigation of failures and then yeah like let's say nine out of ten uh, times the stress the the failure is uh, in the straight pipe mm -hmm. next to the fitting or the or the joint yeah 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 so but i mean i can imagine you still so you have a sieve in the fitting itself and next to the fitting is, is that how is it only all? only next to the fitting so it is a, a sieve for a fitting but you yeah. apply it only next to the fitting ah all yeah. right okay yeah uh, but it's it's um it is in the in the current ISO code, but it's still under development. Uh, it's it's not often used. That must be said because the the height or the not the height, but the, the magnitude of the sieve uh, yeah. that is uh, something that you determine by testing. But ah. uh, the new ISO code is uh, has been published only a few years ago, so more tests need to be done by the pipe manufacturers to get the actual sieves. Yeah. So a lot of people, they still use the old code, uh, the first issue of the ISO design code, and then uh, the safe is applied to the fitting, which is maybe less ac accurate. Uh, yeah. But what you see in the end, um, yeah, you have a high sieve, uh, but uh, your fitting, your, your model, actual wall fingers of the fitting. So also with the old co code, you will see that in the end, the high stresses are found next to the fittings um, and then so also when you use old code the the first issue you will normally uh, in the end have a system where you put some reinforcements next to the fitting so the old code is not uh, it's not too bad but uh, too some yeah. de yeah. developments uh, going on in the code uh, prescribing uh, additional testing to determine this uh, sieve so the the calculation becomes more accurate yeah, I mean, we actually, I mean, we got an interesting question from, from M. Kouros. Uh, Thanks uh, for, for asking. Um, the question is, well, shall we trust software uh, related to SIFs or is there special circumstances that you recommend uh, we use other ways, such as finite element analysis? Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how to find uh, the SIF value? You know, wh where does the software get it from? Uh, what are the options and, and how does this relate to the option of using a uh, finite element analysis? And if that, is that even, even like a good option? Yeah, now it's a very good point. You should, of course, ne never trust uh, the engineering software automatically. Um, also not in this case. Uh, but the SIFs, they do a good job. Uh, you can always come with a more accurate SIF uh, by FEA. But uh, yeah, I must say that... Uh, if you use the SIFs from, from the design standard, that, uh, that does a good job, certainly. It's of course also the, the, the fittings in, in fiberglass, they're all subjected to 1000 hour pressure test. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so if you uh, have uh, qualified components, then all the components, including all the, the fittings, they have uh, passed uh, well, a 1000 hour test at a high pressure. So that is uh, something like 2.4 times the design pressure or maybe three times the design pressure. It depends a bit oh, on wow. the material properties. So it's, yeah, you should never trust the sieve completely, but uh, yeah, there's some qualification testing behind uh, all the fittings. So it's not, uh, it's not too bad. You can and, rely on it uh, reasonably well. And, and um, you just mentioned, um, getting the sieve values from experiments um, or from testing did, is that correct or did i yeah. misunderstand yeah yeah indeed so uh what 
needs to be done and uh, needs to be do done more that the bending moment is applied to a spool with the fitting and straight pipe and uh, depending on the result you have a, a sieve of just one ideally the, there's no weak point in the design right. uh, but less ideally you have uh, a sieve between one and 1.5 so in the the second issue of the iso code the current issue 2017 issue uh, this prescribed it also means that pipe manufacturers need to do this uh, sieve testing when apply the bending moments mm -hmm. but in reality it's not often uh, done so uh, then you if you select the in CISA 2 the the current issue of the ISO code then um, a sieve of 1.5 is applied uh, and you could ask the pipe manufacturer for uh, qualification test results and then apply a sieve uh, lower uh, one or somewhere between one and 1.5 hmm. we, we got a comment from from uh, julian julian uh, thanks for for uh, um, commenting um uh, the comment is the sieves from design standards are probably determined by fva serial examination nowadays uh, now i know edwin you've actually uh, been involved with with fva of sieve values at, at some point in your um, uh, project career um, can you tell us a little bit about you know finite element analysis for for sieves or sorry for for like fittings of FRP? I mean you have this anisotropic material properties. Um, how do you approach that? Yeah, that's um, indeed you can uh, you can model the the fittings with with FEA. It's of course uh, quite specialized work because of the different properties in different directions. And also, if you have a fitting, it's, it's made manually, so you can imagine that the the wall thickness varies a lot um, uh, in in different areas of the fitting. And also, uh, if you have carbon steel piping, you just the the strength of the uh, fitting, the strength of material is a point value, and it's uh, that that is one ingredient that gives you the allowable, and yeah. then. You just model the fitting as accurate as possible, uh, and then you get the the actual stress as precise as possible, and that you can compare with allowable. But yeah. the fiberglass is of course different. You have uh, yeah, it's a laminate, so you bring two materials together, and you can imagine that uh, it's already yeah, the strength of that is already a combination of different materials. But in the fitting, it also can vary a lot how the material is applied. So if you apply more tension, you prevent uh, around the irregular shape, then you prevent uh, voids in your uh, material, but uh, maybe you, you create some voids and uh, yeah, you can imagine that the quality aspect and the workmanship of the fitting is very important. So what is the best way to approach it? And it's covered uh, a bit in the ISA code is that you, uh, but, but not too much, I must say, uh, but that you, uh, uh, do FEA uh, for the for the fittings, but then a good approach is that you have um, uh, qualification or pressure test for the fittings right. available, and for a certain uh, diameter, let's say uh, one thousand diameter elbow, forty inch elbow, and uh, yeah, so you have uh, the test results um, to mimic this test result in an FEA model right. and then yeah you don't you're not exactly sure about the, the strength of the fitting and what is the exact stress because it depends on so many details but you can uh, make a model and at least have an idea of uh, at what pressure it feels so you have by mimicking the actual test you you get a good model that at least does what yeah. what you want that it predicts what sounds like feels. calibrating or something yeah yeah it's a bit like calibrating indeed and then this this calibrated uh model you can make some variations by uh it was a 1000 mm elbow you can vary it to, to 900 mm elbow or 800 or uh, maybe now maybe 700 and uh, or a bit higher and then this calibrated model of course when you make some variation not too big then uh, you can expect everything to, uh, to that that the model is still quite accurate. Hey? You have some linear variations only; it's not too far apart from the original model. So, mm. some variations from the base model, the calibrated model, you can investigate with this FEA model. Uh, but if you have, uh, if 
you go to much smaller dimensions, well, then a lot of things uh, uh, change. It's, it's mainly manually, so maybe the production uh, methods are different for a smaller elbow, or maybe it's, it's, you can imagine that if you make a, an elbow that you can almost hold in your hands, that uh, the fabrication is completely different than when you have a big uh, elbow that you are standing right. around it with four people. So small variation you can investigate with the calibrated model, with big variation, then you uh, need another test result to calibrate the model. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks for, for elaborating on that, Edwin. I want to um, uh, cover two more questions and then start wrapping this up. Um, the first question is from, from Pipetrend. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for asking the question. Uh, it's about PVC and HPDE. So, so how is the PVC or HPDE fiber material compared to uh, fiberglass reinforced plastics? Is it a thermoset, thermoplastic, etc.? cetera? Um, uh, have you ever worked with PVC and HPDE? PVC at home? Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But, uh, PVC, it's, it's, it, it's plastic, but then without, uh, without the glass fiber. So uh, it's only for low pressures uh, or almost nah, not even low pressure, but just pressureless applications. Um, so that is uh, a quite different material and also the joints are not critical because uh, they don't sustain pressure. Hmm. Um, and ACPE, that is, that, uh, well, it, it's not a too strong material, but it's uh, produced in very high thicknesses. And then, uh, yeah, you can also use it to contain uh, high pressure. So ACPE is also used in, in high pressure applications, for example, uh, not too high, but uh, for example, cooling water systems. You talk mm -hmm. about uh, large diameters of uh, one or two meter diameter and pressures of uh, design pressures of five bar, seven bar. And that, uh, it, it, yeah, then you get to the edge of, well, maybe two meters is a bit uh, too ambitious, but uh, one meter with, with seven bar, that's certainly possible with HCPE. Of mm -hmm. course, it has its own challenges to, to, to make the joints. Uh, in these big sizes, it's very thick walled compared to fiberglass that comes okay. with the challenges, but it's, it's also used for, uh, for uh, uh, reasonable high pressure uh, piping. All right, yeah. all right. Thanks, thanks for um, uh, answering that question. Um, last question from, from Bajan. Bajan, thanks for asking. Um, this is about uh, the locking joints, Edwin. Uh, what are the pressure limits for restrained locking joints? Um, he's referring to a 1600 millimeters or, or larger sizes. Uh, and yeah. what ISO standards do these joints qualify on? Okay, can you tell us a little bit about the pressure limits for, for locking joints? Yeah, now the locking joints are mainly used in, uh, also in, in small bore piping, like uh, 200, 300 mm. But the main Which used... one of these? Which one of these Edwin is a locking joint? Is 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 there is the is one of these locking joint? Yeah, it's uh, this one. So this bottom uh, left, right? I think you see the cursor. So you see the two black lines, the the gaskets that we mentioned. Yeah. And this is the locking ring. So uh, mm. in in some uh, you have piping with the locking ring and the grooves, but also uh, pipes without it. Um, so if you have a locking ring, then uh, the locking Part is really the weakest part of the of the piping, um, but you can uh, yeah. Well, it's mainly in in large bore piping. Um, that's where it's often used, uh, which is often underground. And then you don't uh, load the, well the pipe with the locking ring to the to the maximum pressure because the soil resists it. Um, of course, you can always make uh, this this type of joint. With locking ring that uh, sustains the 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 design pressure, but it's often right. or often, but it's also used um, uh, with uh, the locking mechanism not sustaining the full design pressure, but less than that. But uh, well, if buried in combination with the soil restraint, uh, the friction and on the on the end part, the elbows, uh, it it. Uh, takes part of the pressure uh, thrust of the of the joint. So mm -hmm. if you have, um, if you use this uh, yeah, for above ground, that's not what you often see, but uh, underground, uh, large bore piping, that is where you see it. 
but you right. should always be a bit cautious with this uh, because it's a weak uh, point if you have this locking ring uh, very close to the elbow that's uh, for an underground system close to the elbow that's where you have the highest pressure thrust well mm -hmm. then i would yeah i would ask for the for the qualification document to to really be certain that that's wrong uh, so often uh, close to the elbow the first one or two joints are laminated joints and after oh. that you see the locking ring and also mm -hmm. if you have uh, a large diameter chains so or you have a, a a large reducer here and then immediately after that the locking ring then the reducer also puts a lot of pressure thrust on your piping and locking ring so also there i would uh, be careful so the these joints with locking rings you you preferably have them not at location where you put the full pressure thrust on it mm. if you want okay. to do so then then you have the qualification uh program for that that could cover it uh but uh, if not fully qualified then stay away from locations with uh, with a lot of pressure thrust i think that actually like answers or touches the second question like which iso standards do these joints qualify under i mean is that is that just within the iso 14692 um and and uh, let's say you're an engineer and you're involved with or you you need to um you know see how strong such a joint is where would you get that information yeah, indeed, in the in the ISO code, the ISO 14692 covers all the qualification really well. Uh, it's intended for, uh, especially for, for large plants where the reliability of the piping is uh, critical uh, for cooling water system. If you have one leak, the whole uh, uh, refinery is down, for example. Right. Um, so the ISO 14692 covers all the qualification well. Uh, in the end, it refers to all the standards uh, for the complete test program so you do uh, most importantly you do long-term uh, testing uh, you, you start with uh, doing test uh, a series of tests at different uh, durations with the longer longest test being uh, around 10,000 hours so that is mm -hmm. uh, around one year and yeah in, in total you test 20 samples at uh, different uh, durations uh, according to the ASTM code, and then you also perform other tests at, at uh, 1,000 hours, again, uh, described by an other ASTM code. So you have a lot of ASTM codes that uh, describe the specifics of the individual test, but it's all right. brought together by the by the ISO 14692 code hmm. design standard. You also have all the design standards. Some also use the same uh, philosophy of long-term testing. Uh, there are also codes that uh, specify only a, a short-term test, a burst test, to be performed, but then a really large safety factor is used. That's also possible. All right, all right. Um, I mean, Edwin, thanks, thanks for uh, elaborating on such yeah. so, so many topics, uh, and I want to thank everyone uh, in the chat and, and listening to uh, for tuning in and, and you know asking these questions. Um, it's it's been a blast to connect with you, Edwin, and and with with the audience. Um, I just want to uh, you know let everyone know you know this video will be on on YouTube, of course. We'll we'll make sure to have um, any links or reference that we used um, uh, mentioned in the show notes. Uh, and I invite everyone you know to to just check out the fiberglass reinforced uh, piping courses that are available on engineeringtrainer.com. Um, we actually have a free preview of, of a few lessons for um, for people that are interested and just want to have a look around. Um, having said all of this, you know, you know, Edwin, thanks for making the time. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. All right, and I mean, uh, I'm sure you know, looking at the topics, um, there are so many topics. You know, you mentioned this this qualification testing, allowables. I mean, we discussed stress envelope a few days ago. You know, um, I would love to have you uh, uh, back in the future. Um, you know, we, we can touch uh, on, on any of these uh, topics. Um, uh, and and uh, these are surely also included uh, in the courses. So, um, yeah, I hope to have you have you uh, uh, back in the near future, Edwin. Um, but for now, you know, th thanks again and uh, have a great evening. Yeah, same to you. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, uh, hopefully next time. All right, awesome. Yeah. Um,
thanks again for everyone tuning in from, from different locations. Have a great day to you as well.